Early Writings is a work of lasting and special interest to Seventh-day Adventists, for it embodies the earliest L. N. G. White books. These were written and first published in the 1850s, for the edification and instruction of those who, with the author, had passed through the experiences of the Sabbath-keeping Adventists in the 1840s and the early 1850s. This being so, the author assumed on the part of the reader a familiarity with the history of the Advent Awakening and the development of the Seventh-day Adventist movement that emerged in 1844. Consequently, experiences well understood at the time are, in some instances, merely alluded to, and expressions are employed, which, to be correctly understood, must be thought of in the framework of the history of the Sabbath-keeping Adventists in those early years. As the movement neared its high point in the early 1840s, several hundred ministers united in proclaiming the message. In the lead was William Miller. He had before him only his Bible and a concordance. In time, he came in his study to the prophecies of the literal, personal, second coming of Christ. He grappled also with the great time prophecies, particularly the 2,300-day prophecy of Daniel 8 and 9. Which he linked with the prophecy of Revelation 14 and the message of the angel proclaiming the hour of God's judgment, Revelation 14:6-7. Almost immediately following the disappointment of October 22nd, many believers and ministers who had associated themselves with the Advent message dropped away. As we trace the story of the beginning of Sabbath keeping among the early Adventists. We go to a little church in the township of Washington, in the heart of New Hampshire. Here, the members of an independent Christian church in 1843 heard and accepted the preaching of the Advent message. A Seventh-day Baptist, Rachel Oakes, who distributed tracts setting forth the binding claims of the Fourth Commandment, some in 1844 saw and accepted this Bible truth. One of their number, William Farnsworth, in a Sunday morning service. Stood to his feet and declared that he intended to keep God's Sabbath of the Fourth Commandment. A dozen others joined him, taking their stand firmly on all of God's commandments. They were the first Seventh-day Adventists. Elder Bates journeyed to Washington, New Hampshire, to study this newfound truth with the Sabbath-keeping Adventists residing there. Bates, in time, determined to publish a tract setting forth the binding claims of the Fourth Commandment. A copy of it came to the hands of James and Ellen White at about the time of their marriage in late August. From the scriptural evidence therein presented, they accepted and began to keep the Seventh Day Sabbath. The Lord gave a vision to Mrs. White at Topsham, Maine, in which the importance of the Sabbath was stressed. She saw the tables of the law and the ark in the heavenly sanctuary, and a halo of light about the Fourth Commandment. In this revelation. Mrs. White was carried down to the close of time and saw the Sabbath as the great testing truth on which men decide whether to serve God or to serve an apostate power. I believed the truth upon the Sabbath question before I had seen anything in vision in reference to the Sabbath. It was months after I had commenced keeping the Sabbath before I was shown its importance and its place in the third angel's message. Several Sabbath-keeping ministers, who led out in teaching these newfound truths, in company with a number of their followers, came together in 1848 in five Sabbath conferences. At these meetings, the leading doctrines held today by Seventh-day Adventists were brought together. Thus, the doctrinal foundation of the Seventh-day Adventist Church was laid in the faithful study of the Word of God, and when the pioneers could not make headway. Ellen White was given light that helped to explain their difficulty and opened the way for the study to continue. The visions also placed the stamp of God's approval upon correct conclusions. Thus, the prophetic gift acted as a corrector of error and a confirmer of truth. But with these new opportunities and with a larger number of people accepting the message, a few discordant elements came into their midst. If these had not been checked, the work would have been greatly injured. Said the angel, "Walk carefully before him, for he is high and lifted up, 
and the train of his glory fills the temple. I saw that everything in heaven was in perfect order. Said the angel, Look ye, Christ is the head, move in order, move in order. Have a meaning to everything. Said the angel, Behold ye and know how perfect, how beautiful, the order in heaven. Follow it. Except in those places where the practical need was very evident, fear of inviting formality held the believers back from church organization. It was not until a decade after the vision of 1850, that more mature plans for organization were finally affected. In 1860, in connection with the organizing of the publishing work, a name was chosen. Some thought that Church of God would be appropriate, but the sentiment prevailed that the name should reflect the distinctive teachings of the Church. They adopted Seventh day Adventist as their name. The name Seventh day Adventist carries the true features of our faith in front, and will convict the inquiring mind. Like an arrow from the Lord's quiver, it will wound the transgressors of God's law, and will lead to repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. The following year some companies of believers organized themselves into churches. And the churches in Michigan formed a state conference. Soon there were several state conferences. Then in May, 1863, the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists was organized. The Sabbath was made for the benefit of man. And to knowingly transgress the holy commandment forbidding labor upon the seventh day is a crime in the sight of heaven which was of such magnitude under the Mosaic law as to require the death of the offender. But this was not all that the offender was to suffer, for God would not take a transgressor of his law to heaven. He must suffer the second death, which is the full and final penalty for the transgressor of the law of God. There was a mighty earthquake. The graves were opened, and those who had died in faith under the third angel's message, keeping the Sabbath, came forth from their dusty beds. Glorified to hear the covenant of peace that God was to make with those who had kept his law. Ye shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy unto you. Every one that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut, shall be cut off from among his people. <laughs>